with Scott Hartwig. And uh, I worked at Gettysburg National Military Park for 34 years. I was a supervisory historian. Here, I had the job that Chris Gwynn now has. I retired, uh, it's hard to believe, two years ago. And um, I'm, I told my wife this week, I came back from the Y, and I ran into somebody there. And they said to me, they're like, Scott, are you retired? Now, I've been asked that, I think by the same person, about three times. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 I'm retired. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, yeah, still enjoying it, still enjoying it. Um, but I get the impression that people think that when you're retired from the National Park Service, you sit down, you turn the TV on in the morning, and you sit there all day, and you watch TV, and then you kind of amble up, get something to eat, and you go back down. Um, that's not how I live my life. Uh, I hardly watch any television at all. Um, I retired from the National Park Service because I could, and it gave me the opportunity to write. So now I'm beginning to tell people I'm a writer. I'm not retired. Um, I just retired from the Park Service. And uh, I'm working on my sequel to, to Antietam Creek. This is uh, my working title is I Dread the Thought of the Place, The Battle of Antietam. So it carries on the story. It's about the battle and the end of the Maryland campaign. Um, uh, about up to the 12th Corps is entering the East Woods and the cornfield, that part of the battle. So I'm supposed to have it done by 2017, and I'm, I'm working hard to do that. The other thing I'd like to do uh, with the introduction out of the way is just make an acknowledgement. Uh, I know there's a really nice crowd in here. I heard there was a great crowd in here yesterday. I came in yesterday morning for the, um, the book talk with Tony Horowitz, which was absolutely phenomenal. And uh, the acknowledgement I'd like to make is to the guy who took my job, Chris Gwynn. He, he has done a phenomenal job in carrying on these programs that we started a number of years ago. It's not an easy thing to do. It takes a lot of work to plan these things, and I think he's really done an outstanding job. <laughs> he's done what you hope people will do. He's taken something you've worked on, and he's made it better. So uh, I, I think that's something we, we can all appreciate. And if you have the opportunity for these book talks to come in, I know they're going to start the one about uh, William Oates, the commander of the 15th Alabama. <coughs> By all means, do it. It's, it's really, really interesting and a, a really enjoyable experience. Now, to the high water mark. Now, you're going to approach the high water mark today from the south along Hancock Avenue. You can be driving along Hancock Avenue and you have never read a book about the Civil War. You've never been to Gettysburg before. You don't know a blasted thing about this place. But as you drive up and you look at that, you know, without a doubt, that something important happened here. I'm going to stop here. What's that fence doing around those trees? That open book, two cannons over there, and then they, all the monuments and the National Park Service waysides. Something significant happened in this place. Indeed, it did. In fact, as you walk through this, this is an area heavy with symbolism, heavy with memory. One of the most heavily symbolic and laden with memory places, I would say, of any Civil War landscape in the entire country. And it's always been, or for a long time, it's been a very symbolic place. In 1913, 50,000 veterans gathered here. We'll talk about that a little bit later and, and the impact that has on heightening the importance of this place in American culture. Some of you may have been in that group. 2013, there were 40,000 people who participated in the Pickett's Charge commemorative march. 15,000 marched in the footsteps of the Confederates and 25,000 were along Cemetery Ridge. That was the biggest gathering of people for the entire 150th. So it tells you the importance in, in the popular mind of the public of this place on the battlefield. But it wasn't always that way. This photograph was taken by Matthew Brady from Little Round Top in July of 1863, uh, mid-July. And at this time period, you can see the clump of trees and the Bryan Orchard and Ziegler's Grove. It was just a farm landscape. 
Uh, most of the battlefield had been picked up, and the dead were buried on the field. The National Cemetery wasn't even started yet. You go forward 19 years to 1882, and it still doesn't look much different than it did in 1863. You can see some wagon tracks, and that is the clump of trees. That's the copse of trees with the iron fence around it. But let's look at this next picture. Notice how the copse really is part of a brushy area up here around this rocky. The, all these trees are gone. Only this remains. These were here, remnants of these were here when I got here in 1979. But they got trampled to death. I mean, people love this area. So they walked all over the roots of the trees and the trees died. Now there's a sign here. I don't know what the sign says. I think it says something about Pickett's Charge. But as we continue over, there's no monuments, there's no avenues, there's no nothing about Pickett's Charge. No, nothing symbolic, no memory, no nothing here. It's just a battlefield landscape. Now that was going to begin to change. And a person who would have a major role in changing it and shaping our view of this place and the popular view beyond people who are really interested and read a lot about the Civil War, people who just maybe know a little bit about it, and you may ask them, what was the turning point of the Civil War? And they say, oh, Gettysburg. Gettysburg was the turning point of the Civil War. Well, this is the man who has a lot to do with why people think that. John Badger Batchelder. Batchelder was an artist and an educator, <laughs> and uh, he taught at some sort of a military school, so he had this honorary title. You'll sometimes hear him referred to as Colonel John Batchelder. He was never in the Army. He was an artist and an educator. He was with the army in the peninsula in the spring of 1862. Uh, he, he did a lot of paintings when he was down there. He was also thought that that was going to be the climactic campaign of this war. And he got sick, as did a lot of people during that campaign, and then it turned out it wasn't the climactic campaign. He went back to New Hampshire, where he lived. And he was waiting for that battle, that moment that he felt was going to be the turning point of the war. And when he heard about the Battle of Gettysburg, he read about it in the newspaper. This, the day he read about it, he made his plans to leave and come to Gettysburg. He got down here immediately after the battle, and he spent, I believe, 75 days on the battlefield, sketching the landscape, <clears throat> interviewing wounded Union and Confederate soldiers who were here who were ambulatory. He would take them out on the field, <coughs> excuse me, and talk to them about where they'd been and where they'd fought and so on. And went back to New Hampshire after all this work that he spent here, and he worked on this map. This is just a section of it, the isometric map. An isometric map is a bird's eye view of the Gettysburg battlefield. It was endorsed, uh, people don't do this anymore, uh, it was a commercial venture, and it was endorsed by George Gordon Meade, commander of the Army of the Potomac. Everybody who looked at this map in the Army was astounded by it. They all wanted copies of it. It's still an amazing map. Uh, in fact, when we were doing the landscape rehabilitation work here, one of the foundational maps that we used was Batchelder's map because he'd spent so much time here studying the landscape it, right after the Battle of Gettysburg. The other thing that Batchelder did is he spent a lot of time on the battlefield with veterans of the battle. We see him here in 1885. The road you see in front is Hancock Avenue. Uh, that's what Hancock Avenue looked like in 1885, <laughs> and they're near the spot where Hancock was wounded. But he was here with lots of different veterans. In fact, he convened the first time Union and Confederate veterans got together on the battlefield. That was in 1869. They stayed at the Springs Hotel, which is over on where the old Gettysburg Country Club is, was, and um, they spent time touring the battlefield, but also driving in stakes where units were positioned and where specific events had occurred. And one of the, <coughs> excuse me, one of the Confederate officers, and this is not a picture of Walter Harrison in the right, it is Batchelder again. One of the Confederate officers who attended, there weren't very many, was Walter Harrison, who was the AIG, that means Acting Inspector General of Pickett's Division during the Battle of Gettysburg. And I don't know whether it was this time or Harrison came back again, but it was in 1869. Batchelder and Harrison uh, sat underneath the copse of trees because it was hot, so it had to be the summertime, and they were trying to catch the shade. And as they were sitting there and they were 
talking about the battle. He spent a couple of hours here. Harrison uh, said, he ex Batchelder writes this, he explained to me what an important feature that copse of trees was at the time of the battle and how it had been a landmark towards which Longstreet's assault of July the 3rd, 1863, had been directed. This deeply impressed Batchelder, who then writes, he said to Harrison, my colonel, as the Battle of Gettysburg was the crowning event of this campaign, this copse of trees must have been the high watermark of the rebellion. Harrison agreed, and Batchelder wrote, he was imbued with a reverence for those trees. So now he's talked to Walter Harrison. Walter Harrison says, uh, note, Harrison doesn't say that was the objective. That's a lot of mistake people make, is that the clump of trees was the objective. I don't know what they do with them. Uh, make a few fence rails, but uh, there's not really any military value. It was a landmark, is what he was saying. And uh, infantry assaults in the Civil War needed landmarks to guide movements on. So soldiers hit the area you wanted them to strike because they didn't have detailed maps and they didn't have radio communications. So what Harrison's saying is, we use these trees. <clears throat> and Harrison should know. He was on picket staff. So Batchelder is imbued with this... Um, Reverence, but one of the people who wasn't reverent about the cops of trees was Basil Biggs. He's a tough looking fellow, I gotta tell you. He looks hard as a rock. Basil Biggs was a farmer who, an African American farmer who lived west of the battlefield at the time of the battle. He was also a veterinarian, he was very active in the Underground Railroad before the war. This guy was a mover and shaker in the community, and he was an astute businessman. And after the battle was over, he acquired the land that included the copse of trees in the angle. So in 1869, same year Batchelder met with Harrison, he's riding along and he runs into Basil cutting down the copse <laughs> for fence rails. Well, the first thing Batchelder does is he says, my good man, the historical value of these trees. I mean, this is what happened here. It just doesn't, it doesn't work with Biggs. Biggs is like, I'm going to make a living, you know. I'm going to cut the trees down. And Badger was a smart fellow, so he tried a different tact. He said, you know, because of the historical value of these trees, this organization we're going to talk about in a moment, the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, will probably pay pretty good money to acquire this land from you. If you leave these trees intact, they're worth more to you than if you cut them for fence rails. Biggs was a good businessman. Okay, that made sense to him. He preserved the clump of trees. So that's how the copse of trees is preserved between Basil Biggs and John Batchelder. <clears throat> and we mentioned the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. This was an organization that was incorporated in shortly after the battle, in the fall of 1863. It was patriotic local individuals who felt that what had happened at Gettysburg was um, a, maybe not the turning point of the Civil War, but it had been an extremely significant moment. It was the most significant Union victory of the war, and they wanted to preserve it. And to these men, the monument was the battlefield. They were, were not going to do anything to it. No avenues, no monuments, no nothing. We're going to leave it just the way it is. We won't do any restoration, we won't do any rehabilitation, nothing. Well, in 1878, I believe it was, this man uh, attended a veterans reunion on East Cemetery Hill. His name's John Vanderslice. He was, I don't believe Vanderslice was at Gettysburg, but he was a Pennsylvania veteran, a decorated soldier in the Union Army during the war. And Vanderslice um, looked at this landscape and saw great possibilities here that he did not think the GBMA were rising to. They owned some land. They owned a good part of Culp's Hill, East Cemetery Hill, a little bit of land on Little Round Top. They owned where Reynolds had been mortally or killed on July the 1st. So they owned a few pieces of land. They didn't, it wasn't anything that was connected. There was no real overall plan here. What Vanderslice orchestrated was a takeover. He got union veterans to vote out the local, most of the local members of the GBMA board and replace them with uh, a broader Pennsylvania group of veterans, some of whom were people like John Geary, who'd been the uh, governor of Pennsylvania and was a division commander here at Gettysburg. Winfield Hancock would be on the board at one point. So they, he had some um, 
significant people involved, but it was mainly rank-and-file veterans who voted to take over control of the board of the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. Now, Vanderslice is going to institute a number of changes. He wants a, a new direction for this organization, one that encourages the opening of avenues. And this, by the way, folks, is Hancock Avenue. That's it, right there. That's where it's going to be. <laughs> he wants to open avenues up to give people access to areas of the battlefield, uh, particularly for veterans to be able to get there. And, and once you have access, now veterans can raise memorials. He wants veterans to commemorate what they've done on the battlefield. He wants to see that the GBMA acquires more land so that uh, they can get the battlefield. And um, this, this change is going to have a profound effect upon how we see this place we call the high watermark. From what we see here in 1882, where really nothing has happened here except some guys drove their wagons up where Hancock Avenue is going to be, to what it is going to become. <clears throat> So in 1881, in July of 1881, the, the new members are now intact on the board and meeting. And in July of 1881, at, at one of their meetings, they make a decision that they're going to open up an avenue from Tawnytown Road to Little Round Top. They don't name it yet. That avenue will become Hancock Avenue, which runs along Cemetery Ridge. They acquired the angle from Basil Biggs in November of 1881. I think they paid him $470 for the land that he had. So a lot better than cutting those trees down. He made out okay. And in July of 1883, so two years later here, John Batchelder is named the superintendent of tablets and legends. So you're gonna put up a monument or a tablet or a legend or the legend that will be on the tablet or the monument. He's the person who has to approve it. He's not a veteran of the battle, but any veteran worth his salt, who's been in the Battle of Gettysburg, will tell you, if you want to know anything about the battle, you talk to him. He knows more about it than anybody who was in it. Because most of the men who were in it only saw a very small slice of it. They don't really understand the whole battle. Batchelder is viewing the entire battle, and he's met with all these different people, he's written all these things, he's done the map, he knows it better than anyone. That's why he's selected to be the uh, superintendent of tablets and legends. A month after he is named to this post, this monument in the foreground <coughs> will be the first monument placed in the high watermark area, August of 1883. The 72nd Pennsylvania erected it, but the monument is to the Philadelphia Brigade, which occupied the Angle area during uh, Pickett's Charge on July the 3rd. So it's the first monument that's going to be erected there. Now the uh, shortly after this, in October of 1884, the board is meeting and they're trying to plan what they're going to try to do with this land. And they're, they're, it, it's kind of difficult because most of the board has to travel to get to these board meetings. There's some local members, but others have to travel. So they're not meeting all the time. I don't imagine this is like the National Park Service managing this landscape. There's only a couple of guys that they have here who can do work on the field. But in October of 1884, the board directed its resident committee, those members who were living in the Gettysburg area, to mark the spot where Armistead fell with a granite stone. Now remember that, because they don't do it. We don't know why. Maybe they didn't have the money, they couldn't put it together. There was probably some reason like that. But remember that, they don't put this, but they, they direct the local uh, resident committee to put it up but it doesn't go up yet. <clears throat> in November of 1884, perhaps in response to this monument that has gone up, and, and maybe some others, there's not very many more on the field, Batchelder introduces a resolution at one of the board meetings that no tablet or monument shall be permanently erected on the grounds held by the association without permission from the board of directors, nor until its legend has been approved by the superintendent of tablets and legends subject to appeal to the board of directors. So if you want to put a monument on the battlefield, you first have to have it approved on land that the GBMA owns. You have to have it approved by them. And the legend has to be approved by Batchelder, but you can appeal it to the board of directors if you don't like what Batchelder has to tell you. <clears throat> Batchelder also, uh, in 1885, November of 1885, you can see as these years are creeping by, they're not doing a lot right now. 
Uh, there's not a great deal happening here. That's going to change very quickly. But in November of 1885, Batchelder is perceiving because we've opened up Hancock Avenue, we're getting more people coming along. One of the problems that we're encountering is some of these veterans and other people are going into the copse of trees and they're cutting out small trees to make walking sticks and walking canes. And we should protect them. And he makes a motion to erect an iron fence around the copse of trees. And the motion fails. I think the reason the motion failed, they don't have any money. I mean, this would come out of their own pockets. They don't have any money to build an iron fence. And he, he's going to uh, bring it up again in 1886 when they meet again. And again, it's defeated. So there's no iron fence around the copse of trees yet. <clears throat> oh, by the way, on the battlefield, that is, this is where that monument to the Philadelphia Brigade is located in that photograph. Oh, how did that happen? All right. Okay. We're getting there. Somehow it jumped back to the beginning. Okay. Meanwhile, while these things are going on with the GBMA, veterans are at work planning monuments to be placed on the battlefield. And in October of 1885 and June of 1886, Monuments to the 15th. This is the 15th Massachusetts. This is not the monument dedication. I believe this is a sojourn that veterans of the unit made to Gettysburg and to Antietam, and they stopped at their monument. This is the copse of trees. There's their monument. That's the 19th Massachusetts monument. Some veterans around it. That's the copse of trees. You see there's no iron fence. You see all the brush, how rough it is compared to what you see today. And also, the 20th Massachusetts Monument, what's missing? The big pudding stone, right. They haven't installed that yet. Notice again, no iron fence around the copse of trees. Now, the other important thing about this is this is the position that these units all advance to in the counterattack to repulse Pickett's charge. But now we've got even more people coming here more veterans, more just general public, and they are pilfering the trees, and they're going to make a problem with the preservation of the copse of trees. So in February of 1887, it is approved to, there we go, erect this iron fence around the copse of trees. So that's how the, that's how the iron fence that you see today comes to be around the copse of trees. It was really to protect them, but they wanted it also to be decorative. And it was in response to this evolving change that was occurring in this part of the landscape. Now, at this same meeting that they approved putting up the fence in February of 1887, John Vanderslice is going to make a motion that John Batchelder prepare an appropriate and suitable tablet descriptive of the engagement and the commands engaged at the Copse of Trees where Pickett's division assaulted the Union line said tablet to be placed upon a metallic post thereat. Now, this is the idea for a high watermark monument. Pretty simple, though. They're talking about just a post, and they're going to put some uh, tablet on there that talks about the different commands who are involved in this. But remember that, because we'll come back to that, because Bat Batchelder is going to turn that into something much more ambitious, uh, as we'll see. Now, Batchelder approved the three Massachusetts monuments. It's on GBMA land. He had to approve them. He had to approve the legend that was on them. But as Batchelder studied the official reports of the battle and he looked at the maps of the battle, he realized that we were going to have a problem as we moved forward in time. There was going to be a problem not for those who lived the battle, for those who came afterwards, who didn't know the battle very well. The battle could look like a jumble of monuments, because what he learned was that there were 10 other regiments that advanced to this point in the counterattack against the uh, Confederate breakthrough at the angle. You're going to have 13 monuments gathered right there. How'd they get there? It's confusing, Batchelder thought. So he traveled to Washington, D.C., and he met with the Secretary of War, a man named William Endicott. He also met with some regular army officers who'd been in the volunteer army during the war. And they discussed how we should handle this. And they, they came up with a unanimous decision 
And that decision was that the desire of the Memorial Association would be better carried out if the lines of battle were marked rather than the lines of contact when any regiment left their position to go into action. Where those tablets are is where the Massachusetts regiments moved to contact, not where they were in the line of battle. Batchelder and the Secretary of War and these Army officers felt people could understand the battle much better if you mark the lines of battle, the general position that the armies occupied, July 1, 2, and 3, rather than where they moved to. And what you could do is once you erected your principal monument on the line of battle, you could erect an advanced position marker and on the legend of that, tell how you'd advanced to such and such a position and what you'd done when you got there. So, um, Batchelder is going to now move to the GBMA board because they adopt this policy and we call it the line of battle policy. And it's still in place today. Uh, even though we don't erect monuments anymore, but when the 11th Mississippi Monument went up, that's the last regimental monument that went up on the battlefield, they had to erect a monument on the Confederate line of battle and then they put an advanced position marker up near the Bryan Farm. Uh, they wanted to put their monument up near the Bryan Farm, but that this policy was still in is still in place. So the, um, the GBMA approved it. Um, they, it would go forward with it, but now what Batchelder proposed is we need to move the monuments that are already in place to bring them into compliance with this new policy. And that meant that they had to go to the three Massachusetts regiments and ask them if they would move their monuments, and they all agreed to do it. So once they'd moved, remember the 19th Massachusetts was right here. That was where their monument was. That's the 19th now. And there's Hancock Avenue. So they moved to the second line because they were in the support line when the assault came. And they advanced to that position where they first put their monument and engaged the Confederates at that point in the Copse of Trees. So uh, these men all come in compliance with it. It was a big deal for them because you can understand the logic of wanting to be up right near at the, at the Copse of Trees. So they've moved their monuments, and uh, at this same meeting, this, these meetings are beginning to become more eventful that the GBMA is having. This is in December of 1887. There was a party from the Pickett's Division camp down in Virginia, uh, United Confederate Veterans. And they came and they asked permission to erect a monument to where Armistead had fallen. Remember who had already approved that? The GBMA but they just passed a new policy, the line of battle policy. You gotta put your monument on the line of battle. So what they tell the Pickett's veterans, they're like, well, nah, we can't do that. You can't put your monument where you wanna put it, where Armistead fell. We recommend that you put this monument on the Confederate lines when, when those are acquired. Now that was gonna be a problem because the GBMA's charter didn't allow them to acquire land, or they couldn't condemn land that was behind Confederate lines or on Confederate lines. Uh, they had to get the, the seller to give them the land at whatever price. So the odds that that was gonna happen, these Confederate veterans didn't seem very good and they weren't very happy and they left dissatisfied. So it seemed like they were using this line of battle policy um, pretty strictly in this case, but there was more to it here. It was also about memory. We were wrestling with memory here how we were going to remember what happened at the angle. There had been a monument erected in 1886 on Culp's Hill to the 1st Maryland Battalion CSA. And initially that monument had been approved to be inside the Union lines, because that's actually where the regiment advanced to and took a position. Union veterans got wind of it and they went bananas. And they moved the monument outside Union lines, right next to the Union breastworks, but it's outside the Union breastworks. And David Bueller, who was the vice president of the GBMA, writes to Batchelder a month after the first Maryland monument dedication. And in this uh, passage I'll read to you, you get another sense of why they don't want the Armistead marker. He writes to Batchelder, saying that the aim of the Maryland Regiment, Confederate, in the erection of their monument was not so much to mark their position as to glorify their achievements on this field. It was the disclosure of this spirit in our intercourse with the committee which induced me to call a halt 
on the proposition to open up the field to the erection of Confederate monuments, with the incidents and dedication services, etc. The historical delineation of the field is one thing. The erection of monuments in honor of what was done here is quite another. So that's what really was at play in denying uh, Pickett's veterans the opportunity to place this monument to Armistead. <clears throat> but that's going to change. Because while the Pickett's veterans are coming forward in front of the GBMA and asking them to erect this monument to Armistead, there were plans in Philadelphia for a big reunion of the Philadelphia Brigade on the Gettysburg battlefield that would occur in July of 1887. They were going to dedicate the monuments to the 69th, the 71st Pennsylvania, and also a small stone that Colonel R. Penn Smith and the 71st Pennsylvania were going to erect to the memory of Alonzo Cushing. This was going to be a big event, and it's a union event. But some of the members of the Philadelphia Brigade felt that the time was right to kind of bury the hatchet. And let's invite some of the men we fought to come to this event. The pro-invite Confederates, because there was a large contingent of men who were anti-invite any Confederates to come to this Philadelphia Brigade reunion. But the pro-invite group wrote that they believed it was their holy and patriotic duty to invite our late foes to meet us in fraternal reunion on that field that turned the tide of the war. And there set the example of burying forever all animosities. They also justified the reunion on the grounds that our victory would be fruitless if all the citizens of all sections of the country could not enjoy equal rights and privileges as guaranteed by the Constitution of our country. And noticing that bitter hatreds were kept alive by unscrupulous and designing men, they felt it was their duty to attempt to reverse this. Now, today as I look back on this, I think that it, um, to mend these sectional animosities, that the war had brought on and still existed very powerfully was really an admirable goal by these men. But there's something we need to remember, that um, their justification for inviting Pickett's veterans also speaks to me of the nationwide retreat by this point in our history to Lincoln's vision of a new birth of freedom. Because in 1887, the only Americans in the United States of America whose constitutional rights and privileges were threatened were Southern blacks, not former Confederate soldiers. They had all their rights. They got them all back. Pickett's veterans, when they got the invitation, said no. Why do you think they said no? The GBMA told them they couldn't put their monument up. And they were ticked about it. Well, some of the Pennsylvanians got wind of this and they said, listen, if you'll come, you'll get your monument. If you'll come, we will make sure you get your monument. <laughs> they did. And they came. About 300 of Pickett's veterans came to the reunion. Also at attending with them was LaSalle Pickett, Pickett's widow. And overall, the reunion, uh, this is a photograph that we'll talk about in just a moment, the reunion was a huge success, huge success. The emphasis, unsurprisingly, was upon the mutual shared courage and the danger that they'd all shared, the fraternity of veterans. There had been tremendous suspicion on both sides about what this was all about. Is this a Yankee trap, or what are these rebels doing here, and what are they going to do? But Anthony McDermott, who was in the 69th Pennsylvania, said LaSalle Pickett was so gracious and so charming, he said it converted a lot of hard cases into the most intense advocates of fraternity toward our late opponents. William Aylett, the grandson of Patrick Henry, who had become the commander of Armistead's brigade after the battle, also may have softened some feelings when, in a speech he gave at the county courthouse the first night of the reunion, said the following, we have come forth from the baptism of blood and fire in which we were consumed as the representatives of a new South. And we have long ago, we have long years ago, ceased to bear in our hearts any residuum of the feelings born of the conflict. He also spoke of above the ashes left by the war and over the tomb of secession and African slavery, we have created a new empire and have built a temple to American liberty in which you and I can worship together and over it we have run up the star-spangled banner. On July the 4th, they took a tour of the battlefield with Batchelder 
And when they came up towards the angle, someone came up with the idea that, hey, we ought to get Pickett's guys on one side of the wall, and let's get the guys from the 69th on the other side. And the men in the 69th all have these white pith helmets on. And you can see there's a barbed wire fence, so they couldn't go very far, Pickett's men. But Pickett's men climbed up over the wall on the one side, actually standing on the wall. And the men of the 69th, behind the wall they defended, they extended their hands, everybody shook hands. And uh, it's, it's easy today as we look back to kind of say, oh, well, you know, you know it's a bunch of white guys shaking hands over the wall. Um, but we can't forget that these white guys slaughtered each other over this same wall 24 years ago. You might be shaking the hands of somebody who killed your best buddy. Um, you may be shaking the hands of somebody who killed his brother. You didn't know what it was, but the, the emotions and the memories that must have flooded these men's, their, their bodies and their minds, is this, it, it's pretty profound. And I think it was a, I think it was a great moment on this battlefield. And, and it was a very symbolic moment in transforming this high water mark into something more than just a battlefield landscape. This, remember, that's with the GBMA. It was just a battlefield landscape. That's what we were going to preserve. The battlefield's the monument. And the veterans are, are beginning to make it evolve into something more. <coughs> it's becoming more than a monument to Union valor and victory. They're trying to transform it now also into a place of reconciliation by seeking this common ground of mutual shared courage, which both sides could agree on. But again, we can't forget. But as these, great as these fraternal feelings were, and that handshake over the wall, the meaning of Lincoln's new birth of freedom was being pushed to the side. Now, five years after that event, the Philadelphia Brigade reunion, and by the way, these, these guys kept having reunions into the 20th century. And they got to know each other so well that families married one another, they had children, and I think there's grandchildren and so on today as a result of these reunions. So they really, really were successful. It wasn't a one-time thing. But Batchelder finally is going to achieve his dream. 1892, the High Water Mark Monument is dedicated at the Cops of Trees. Notice how different that looks there in 1892 from that 1882. That's just 10 years, how, how it has been transformed and changed in that, in that time period. Batchelder, remember, he was tasked with doing this. He personally prepared and discarded more than 20 different designs. He made the contracts. He visited the legislatures. He secured the appropriations. He paid the bills on this precisely as though it was my private enterprise. In fact, part of it was because they were short of money and he had to pay it out of his own pocket to get this monument up. Uh, he had to do all this because the GBMA made it clear there were no funds to erect this monument. So even though they're behind it, it really was Batchelder who made this monument happen. The final design that he uh, settled upon was this open book that you see. Let me get a little... There we go. That's a close-up of it. It's an open book supported by pyramids of cannonballs flanked by two Napoleon cannon. The legend that he prepared, as you can see there, it was not interpretive. It didn't address the cause. It didn't address the consequence of the battle or the war, except obliquely in the inscription for, quote, commands honored, which stated, in recognition of the patriotism and gallantry displayed by their respective troops, who met or assisted to repulse Longstreet's assault. Then it listed those states that made contribution to the monument's preparation. And uh, in all the places on this, you can see, it says Longstreet's assault. It doesn't say Pickett's charge anywhere on there. That's one part of shaping memory that Batchelder didn't win. What do we call it today? Pickett's charge, right? He lost that one. It's still there, but nobody calls it Longstreet's assault, hardly at all. But they all called the high watermark. And if you ask that average American on the street, what was the turning point of the Civil War? They go back to what Batchelder shaped our memory to. Because so many millions of people have seen this over the years and heard about it and seen photos of it and read about it. And I don't care how many historians have written books trying to dethrone Gettysburg. And I'll, I'll stand up with them and say, there is no single turning point of the Civil War. But Batchelder won this battle because in popular memory, it is seen as the turning point of the Civil War. So we've seen this battlefield evolving from this simple landscape to a place of memory, reconciliation, and a turning point of the war.
The other thing I, I hope that you're picking up on this as well is there's no grand design here. There's no document that someone can open up and say, this is how they designed the park. The park is an evolution. It's an evolution that we're responding to um, external forces, and, and in these early years, it's primarily veterans who are coming to the field and wanting certain things, and you're reacting to what these veterans want, and you're trying to do the best that you possibly can. In remembering what happened here, commemorating what happened here, and marking what happened here for them and for you in the future to understand what happened. <clears throat> There was one thing that marred this landscape, this, this progression of events that seemed to be going so well. And it was the 72nd Pennsylvania Monument. On June 15, 1887, the Pennsylvania legislature passed an act that appropriated $125,000 to the GBMA for the purpose of marking the positions of Pennsylvania commands on the battlefield. The governor of the state appointed a five-man commission whose job it was to meet on the field with representatives of the different Pennsylvania regiments and batteries and working with the new line of battle policy of the GBMA mark the positions of those commands. And for two days in April of 1888, the commission met on the field with regimental and battery representatives of the Pennsylvania commands and they marked their positions with stakes. In the case of the 72nd Pennsylvania, I don't think any of their veterans were able to be here. So the commissioners um, did the best that they could, and they drove a stake in the ground right where you see this, approximately here. So this is uh, looking at the 1882 photograph. There's Hancock Avenue. That's about where they marked that the monument to the 72nd Pennsylvania should be, because they were on the second line. Remember I showed you the picture of the 19th Massachusetts? They were on the second line. So they were saying, this was your line of battle position. That's where your monument goes. So when word of the stake being driven in the ground reached the veterans of the 72nd, uh, a number of them objected to its location. They wanted to be placed right up at the stone wall between the 69th Pennsylvania and the 71st Pennsylvania. They said, that's where we were. So the commission was trying to honor what these veterans wanted, so they agreed to meet with members of the Philadelphia Brigade in Philadelphia. <clears throat> they also had some fellows from other regiments that came to this. And during the meeting, uh, this General J.P.S. Gobin, he was one of the commissioners uh, from, that the governor had appointed, one of these Pennsylvania commissioners to mark positions of Pennsylvania commands. He testified that the allegation was made that we had been mistaken in the location of the monument, of the 72nd, but some men from other regiments challenged the 72nd's argument and claimed that the 72nd was not entitled to go down where they wanted to go, down near the angle. One of the most vocal opponents of the 72nd going forward was this fellow Anthony McDermott. He was a private during the battle. He would write the regimental history of the 69th Pennsylvania. He didn't want them down there. He said they, didn't, they weren't there. They came up there at the end of the fight, but he said you know, they weren't there. So on July the 3rd, 1888, <coughs> several members of the Governor's Commission and a committee from the 72nd Pennsylvania come to Gettysburg and they appear before the Board of Directors of the GBMA to discuss the monument. So the veterans of the 72nd again protest the location of their monument. They want it placed in the front line between the 71st and the 69th. Remember those were both put up in 1887 and on the motion of Batchelder, the GBMA ruled that the 72nd would have to erect its principal monument where the commissioners had placed it on the crest of the ridge where evidence, as Batchelder presented, placed them during the fight. So they kept arguing, and finally the GBMA relented. They were like, okay, all right, all right, we did allow you to put that monument up here, remember? This was the line that the 72nd probably advanced to and took most of their casualties on. You can put your monument there, probably near where the Philadelphia Brigade Monument was located. 72nd survivors rejected that compromise, and they continued to press to have their monument placed up at the wall. So sometime after this July 3rd meeting, the governor's commissions, commissioners agree to meet with the representatives of the 72nd again in Gettysburg. 
They also invited Anthony McDermott to come out to make his case against the 72nd. But McDermott couldn't attend, but the commissioners, so all they heard one from was guys from the 72nd. They said it was a very large delegation of men from that regiment. However, the testimony failed to sway the commissioners, and they were inclined to not to move the monument any farther forward than this position that the GBMA had agreed to. John P. Nicholson, who had become the superintendent uh, of Gettysburg National Military Park, eventually under the um, War Department Commission, he was one of the commissioners for this Pennsylvania Commission. And he said the veterans of the 72nd were very much dissatisfied with this decision. So these guys are angry. They are insistent. They want their monument up. So Nicholson and the other commissioners, it's getting late in the day. They agree. They'll transfer the meeting to the United States Hotel in Harrisburg. And they'll hold an evening session to further discuss this question of the 72nd's monument. So they have this meeting. General Gobin says it went to 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. The, these commissioners are sitting around and discussing this. And Gobin says, we're at a loss to know what to do in view of our desire to locate the monument just where it belonged. But Samuel Harper, who was the secretary of the committee, found what he thought was the breakthrough. And it was this passage in the GBMA policy. If the same line was held by other troops, the monuments must be placed in the order in which the several commands occupied the grounds. The first being the first line, the second at least 20 feet in rear of it, and so on, the inscriptions explaining the movements. Now, I can interpret that pretty clearly, and that means that if that stone wall had the 1st Brigade of the 1st Division of the 2nd Corps there on July the 2nd, and the second brigade of the first division came up and relieved them, their monuments go 20 feet behind the first guys who were there, right? That's what it means. You were in the line of battle there. You didn't advance there. You were in the line of battle there. But I think these guys were exhausted. You know, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. And they see this, and they're like, ha, ah, OK. That's, let's go down and tell the guys from the 72nd. They can put their monument up 20 feet back from the wall. So they went down, they explained that to the veterans, and the veterans said, OK, all right, sounds good. The only problem was you still needed to have the GBMA approve this. They don't know anything about it. See, these guys are from the governor's commission. The governor's commission has met with these 72nd veterans, and they have said, look, we'll put the monument 20 feet back from the wall, and then we'll tell the GBMA. But they don't tell the GBMA for whatever reason. So in December of 1888, some fellows from the 72nd Pennsylvania came out, and they drove a stake in the ground right about here. And as they were doing so, uh, somebody from the GBMA came out and said, what are you doing? We're putting a stake in for a monument. You're defacing GBMA land. You're under arrest. <laughs> they arrested them for trespass. So we're going to go to court. <laughs> And on January 7th, 1889, the 72nd Pennsylvania filed a bill in Adams County Court requesting that the committee be allowed to erect its monument where the agreement made with the State Commission in Harrisburg located it. The GBMA objected, it, and the court sustained them and dismissed the case. So they win. But it's not over. 72nd appealed it. And the case went to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court where it heard a uh, tremendous amount of testimony from many veterans, most from the 72nd, but also from Alexander Webb, the brigade commander, from Anthony McDermott, from some other fellows in the 69th, some fellows in the 71st Pennsylvania, they, some fellows from the 19th Massachusetts. They saw after action reports. There were maps. There was a lot of documents that they were able to use. Uh, a friend of mine who's an attorney said that um, he's read through the entire case, and he's convinced that somebody got paid off. <laughs> Is where's the monument? <laughs> Who won that case? 72nd. They won the case. And it now appears, it's a great monument. It's an iconic monument. But for the average person who comes up says, oh, those guys fought hand to hand right there at the wall against Pickett's charge. When Arthur Devereaux, who was a major in the 19th Massachusetts, heard about this, he was furious. Remember those guys? They all moved their monuments back. They all went where they were asked to go. How is it? And if, as stated on what grounds, he wrote John Batchelder. He was incredulous. 
Would the Honorable Board of Trustees of the GBMA permit me to put the monument of my regiment to the front where it belongs, or must it stay away back where it gives no sort of idea of the service performed by it? Then he asked rhetorically, what is the value of a monument in the field anyhow when it attempts to enforce a lie? I permitted the removal of my regiment's monument back to the meet the ideas of the trustees, but not anticipating such a travesty of truth thereby. Eight months later, he kind of softened. And he writes Bachelor, I'm getting reconciled with the 70 Seconds Monument. It blazons their shame, and the story will be told to all comers. And they might have seen the waters of oblivion roll over it, but, to, but for their own action. The GBMA felt obliged in uh, their executive committee to issue a public statement about this. And they wrote, this mis mislocation of the 70 Seconds Monument is the only break in the harmony of the entire field. It is the only act done for which we feel that an apology is required to be made to anyone. In so locating it, law was misunderstood and misinterpreted, facts were misunderstood, and inferences were unjustifiably drawn. The association sought by every means within its power to save our commonwealth from an error, which puts it in a false position before the entire Army of the Potomac and therefore before the whole country. But for all the predictions, by the GBMA and by Devereaux and by others that the monument placement was going to bring great shame on the 72nd and upon Pennsylvania and that the truth was going to be told to all comers, it wasn't to be. The truth isn't told to any comers. Uh, the 72nd Pennsylvania won the Battle of Memory here. Uh, in fact, uh, the coin, what is it, the quarter, the Gettysburg, that's a monument on it. Now when I saw it, I was like, it's an iconic monument. What better photograph can you take when the sun is setting to get the 72nd Pennsylvania Monument and the Kadori Farm? It's brilliant. It is a brilliant design. You notice they got it just back. It's 20 feet back from the front wall and infuriated the veterans of the 69th and the 71st. But this was a battle about memory. And in this battle, the 72nd won. This, pl this place, as I said, has, has become this place of reconciliation. And, and nowhere was this um, more solidified than in 1913. The grand reunion on the Gettysburg battlefield when 50,000 veterans from all parts of the country are going to convene on Gettysburg <coughs> between July 1 through 4 for the greatest reunion that ever occurs in the Civil War. And the pinnacle of this reunion the high point of this reunion is going to be at this most symbolic place, the high water mark. John H. Leathers of Kentucky, who was a former sergeant in the 2nd Virginia, sounded a familiar theme that you'd hear over and over again at this event. All the bitterness of the war is gone with a flight of years. We stand here today glorifying in one common cause, one common flag, the flag of a reunited country. Captain Andrew Cowan, whose artillery battery had mowed Confederates down with canister fire, he would speak, this grand celebration marks the high tide of peace between the North and South, which shall never recede while Americans love liberty and union. And Virginia Governor William Mann affirmed that the nation shouldn't forget the years 1861 to 65. We came here to say not to discuss what caused the war from 1861 to 65, but to talk over the events of the battle. Here is man to man and his comrade to comrade to shake hands as brothers and to recognize in each the splendid courage displayed upon this remarkable field of battle. The high water mark was now emblematic of the good fight, of sublime American courage in which both whites of the North and the South could share. Reinforcing this was President Woodrow Wilson. In his speech inside the Great Ten on July the 4th, he said, we have found one another again as brothers and comrades, as brothers and comrades in arms, enemies no longer, generous friends rather, our battles long past, the quarrel forgotten. Except that we shall not forget the splendid valor, the manly devotion of the men then arrayed against one another, now grasping hands and smiling into each other's eyes. In a staged but very symbolic moment, they got the veterans of Pickett's division. These are Pickett's men here. And these are the Philadelphia Brigade. Look at that guy right there. He's ready. <laughs> Some of these fellows, I studied their eyes. 
And uh, you can see something in their eyes. Uh, there's some memories coming back to these men. Others, it's more of a, you know, just kind of a frolic for them. Maybe they weren't here that day. Um, but <coughs> they're going to have the veterans of, Philadelphia, of the Philadelphia Brigade and Pickett's Division shake hands over the stone wall they'd fought over 50 years earlier, photograph it. And Pennsylvania Congressman J. Hampton Moore assembled the, uh, addressed all the assembled veterans after the handshake. You meet again here at the bloody angle, the very zenith of the mighty current of the war, not as furious fighting champions of state or section, but as messengers of peace. You have truly made this ground more sacred by uniting upon it in bonds of amity and fellowship. So Batchelder's high watermark had become now the very zenith of the war and the sacred ground of peace and unity. Now passages from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address were sprinkled throughout many of the speeches given during the four days. Governor Mann of Virginia declared, if Lincoln could come back here and see what is going on, how his patri patriotic heart would swell with pleasure when he saw the blue and the gray mingling as they are today as friends and comrades. No doubt Lincoln would have. For the union, reunion was a very important and necessary moment in the nation's healing from the war. But I think Lincoln also probably would have encouraged everyone present to reread his Gettysburg Address and contemplate what he meant. The nation in 1913 was in full retreat from the new birth of freedom. He hoped that the war might usher in. Jim Crow racial segregation was the law of the land across the South, and President Woodrow Wilson was in the process of segregating uh, departments of the United States government by race. But there was no mention of this at the angle in 1913. It belonged to the quarrel forgotten. And thus, as David Blight wrote in his Race and Reunion, the Gettysburg Reunion <coughs> took place as a national ritual in which the ghosts of slavery the very questions of cause and consequence might be exercised once and for all in an epic conflict among whites elevated in the national mythology. But they weren't all white veterans there that, those days. Uh, these two men, they may have been the only African-American Union veterans in 1913 who have ended, attended that event. David Blight writes there were none. But the only reason we know these members here is a friend of mine whose wife works at a little historical society in North Carolina found this photograph. It's a Confederate soldier who took this photograph, and you read what it says, contraband of war. One of these Negroes said he belonged to a man in Norfolk, and the other one belonged in Wayne County, and both ran away to enlist in the Federal Army. They live now in Philadelphia. When I see these two men, what these two men represented, and I think why they were there, is maybe most of the nation was retreating from the new birth of freedom, this idea that Lincoln had advanced in his Gettysburg Address. But they'd lived it. They'd lived the idea. Uh, they hadn't been free. They'd been slaves. They'd run away. They'd volunteered to fight. They'd risked their lives. And they were a reminder to everybody who was present that this war was about more than American valor. It was about something. So today, when I look at the high water mark, in many respects, it hasn't shaken off the memory that was attached to it in, in 1913 or even in 1887. You only have to visit the place on Remembrance Day in November or on the afternoon of a July 3rd anniversary to see that it's still celebrated primarily as a symbol of shared American valor. The causes and the consequences the reasons men went to war and turned this into a killing ground on July the 3rd remain largely absent. Perhaps one day this will change, and we can celebrate both American valor and courage shown by Union and Confederate soldiers, and the fact that here, at this high water mark, the end of slavery in America and the hope of a new birth of freedom won a crucial victory. Thank you.